just wanted to mention that the, the session is being recorded and that um, when you, if you have a question and answer, if you don't want to be identified, just don't state your name on the, when you ask a question. It's, it's only us being recorded, it's not you being recorded. <laughs> um, so our session is um, on the perspectives from the ground evaluating adaptation to climate change in the water sector. And we had, um, we had someone from the EPA, Britta Johnson, who was unable to join us because of the furlough. Um, so she, um, she, she couldn't make it. Uh, so we had wanted at least two perspectives, one that was more domestic and one more international. But we will then focus on the adaptation fund's experience to date with, um, with that portfolio, with our portfolio. Um, I work at the Secretariat. Um, and um, my colleague Dauda Jane, I can never pronounce her last name. <laughs> Najai, sorry, will be uh, will be talking about the portfolio. And then we are very lucky to have Dennis Bors um, with us um, from the Sea Change Community of Practice, um, who will act as a discussant. And then we will open it up to questions. So the the presentation will be about twenty minutes. Um, Dennis will take about ten. Five to ten. Five to ten minutes, and then we will um, open it up to any questions you have. Um, thank you. And so I'll turn it over to Dada. Thank you, Dima. Um, let me know if you want to be my first. I can speak very. I'm not really loud. Um, okay, I will start with. Um, no view trying to trying to explain how the adaptation fund um, works, uh, starting with the, the the goal of the of the fund, which is to increase the resilience to concrete adaptation projects and programs. I will come back to that definition of concrete later. Um, and also the the uh, particularity of uh, focusing on the most vulnerable communities. Um, the Adaptation Fund has, a, has a, three main um, particularities, we can say. The, the first thing is at the board level of the fund. We, the, it's one of the first funds where the, the, the board is governed by a majority of um, developing countries. Um, the, Second particularity is um, at the funding level in terms of um, um, the way money used to be received at the fund. Um, there was a levy on, there's still a levy on the field development mechanism proceeds uh, where 2% of the proceeds go, go to the fund. But also the, we have another um, source of funding, which is uh, donations from countries or individuals. And the last particularity is the, the direct access, where countries uh, have the possibility to receive funding directly from the fund after being uh, accredited, after one of their institutions get accredited by the, by the fund. Um, as of now, we have 20, 29 projects and programs in uh, renewable developing countries, and they cover the five UN regions, as you can see in this map. And uh, in terms of sectors, uh, these projects cover different sectors uh, from agriculture to coastal management, disaster risk reduction, rural development, um, food security, um, and also water management. Um, this presentation today will focus on the water management sector. Um, <coughs> we, we, when we receive proposals, we, we have a look at, at those proposals and we uh, define if if the proponents don't do so, we define in which sector this, this uh, uh, project um, 
can be categorized. And we have uh, six projects where we can say that these are water management projects. Uh, but when you look at other proposals, you see that many of them where it's about agriculture and it's about coastal uh, development, uh, rural development, you can see that also uh, you have some water management components in those, in those, uh, in those proposals. Um, now to get to the, to the monitoring and evaluation, um, in all our projects, the, the, the process is the same in terms of um, monitoring. We, we, we have this uh, system of uh, annual reporting, so that's, that's uh, the project level. We receive annual reports from from the from the project proponents. Um, there is also a system of of, uh, of uh, results tracking that's at the portfolio level, where we have a um, a um, results tracker that the proponents have to fill out at the beginning of the. Uh, project implementation, but also at midterm and at the final uh, uh, at project closing. Uh, at the level of the fund also, the Secretariat prepares uh, each year an annual performance reports, and it's, it's um, part of it analyzes the different uh, performance reports that we receive from individual projects and we try to um, aggregate the results based on the uh, results, the fund results framework that was established. I don't know if um, uh, some of you were at the presentation of DIMA earlier, but basically the adaptation fund has got um, seven um, fund level outcomes uh, and I think they cover all of the adaptation issues and projects have to uh, show how they align with, with, with uh, those uh, outcomes. They don't have to align with all of them but they, uh, we have a you know, table that they have to fill out to show how their uh, project level outcomes align with the fund level outputs. So, um, also, all of the projects have to um, perform a terminal evaluation at the end of the project. In the case of projects um, of more than four, uh, less than four years, they don't have to um, have a midterm evaluation, but uh, more than four years, they also have to uh, submit a midterm evaluation. One other thing to mention in terms of uh, monitoring and evaluation is the um, portfolio monitoring missions that at the secretariat level, we, are, we have started. Um, we have visited uh, two projects up to now, and we're planning on visiting uh, three more this year. And this is going to be part of our um, monitoring and evaluation system. Now I will get to um, a few projects on water management, just to just to illustrate, um, for example, this pro project in Georgia is about developing climate resilient flood and flash flood <coughs> management practices to protect vulnerable communities of Georgia. And um, the challenge is that even if the outcomes are 
achieve will they lead to increased resilience of those communities to, to, to flood sharks? When you look at the, the, the timeline of, of the projects, four years, um, the question is, okay, now, now how do you uh, get to evaluate the impacts of these, of these projects? You look at the expected outcomes of these projects, um, most of them, they cover basically three areas. They will um, try to um, um, strengthen the institutional and individual capacities to be able to deal with the specific issue, uh, adaptation issue. Here it's about water management. The second aspect is um, about uh, looking at the policies, strengthening the policies, and then since uh, the adaptation fund is funding mainly concrete activities uh, which are supposed to, to ge generate tangible um, impacts on the ground, that's where you have, uh, for example, in this Georgia project, uh, the outcome two dealing with direct investments and local actions in highly exposed and vulnerable communities. So, basically, you have these activities and uh, during the lifetime of the project, the project proponents, the, the, the implementing entities, they will focus on their project specific uh, indicators and try to show that they have achieved these, these uh, outcomes, trying to, trying to do some, some, some training, uh, some looking at institutional capacities to deal with the, with the issue, um, looking at um, trying to, to, to build some, some, some uh, water, water management systems to, to deal with the, the, the climate change issue. This is a second case in uh, Nicaragua where it's about uh, dealing with drought and flooding in, in, in a watershed. And basically the issue is the same, uh, how they try to deal with it, policies, uh, uh, concrete adaptation actions, and also uh, capacity building to make sure that uh, there is a reduced exposure at the national level to to climate-related hazards and, and, and threats. So, like I was saying, what we what we try to do to, to be able to really uh, um, monitor at the portfolio level is to to, to ask them um, to align their indicators with fund-level indicators. You know that they cannot do it for all of the indicators, but at least to select some indicators and align them with the, the fund level indicators so that we are able to aggregate at the fund, at the fund level. This is an example of, of uh, that exercise uh, where you have the fund outcome uh, output level and uh, here, there are the fund outcome output indicators related to, 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 to um, information uh, generation, related to, to the target communities, the beneficiaries, and, and, and how they are going to increase um, access to livelihood assets and also um, one on the policy and strategies. And the, in the project document, they provide information on, on, on the target in these specific areas. So when we have that for, for uh, 
Right now, we only receive a, uh, about seven, eight uh, annual reports from, from our projects. But at least we know that the framework, the system is in place uh, at the fund level so that in the future we will be able to aggregate more of these indicators to, 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 to know how to uh, monitor and evaluate these and, and, and take uh, lessons from, from, from our portfolio. Um, I would like to say also that we don't have any projects completed yet. The most advanced one is about to close maybe early next year. But at least we have we have the system in place. We we know that at the project level there will be uh, evaluation, the terminal evaluation of, of that project. And uh, we have the evaluation function in place so that uh, an independent evaluation function so that when when we uh, receive more of these uh, terminal evaluation from 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 the projects, <coughs> there will be a, an independent evaluation of the whole portfolio. Uh, this is another project in Honduras. So so to finish the the, the lessons to to date. The early, uh, at a very early stage, because, like I said, uh, we we have a very young portfolio, uh, um, 29 projects and programs, and uh, maybe half of them have really uh, started implementation right now. We have received maybe about 10 uh, annual reports only and we don't have any uh, uh, terminal evaluations yet but at least the early lessons today are that uh, when you uh, get only uh, information on, on, on some some indicators at the project level they they don't give you really an understanding of whether the communities uh, uh, in the targeted area are more resilient to incidents in flooding or drought uh, because of the different of, of, of time scale between, between project implementation and, and the impacts that these projects will, will have in the target areas. Um, also, um, because of the way projects function, you know that the uh, implementer of the project at, at the time of the project implementation is more um, focused on trying to make this project work based on his own uh, monitoring system. So they, they want to finish their activities and uh, complete the projects. That's it. So, so how do you how do you make sure that the, the, the aspect of impact is uh, part of their work? It's, it's different because of, it's difficult because of the difference in time frame as well. Longer term impacts of any intervention are usually not within the time frame of the project, that's what I was explaining. And finally, a, um, Looking at looking at the different indicators that that uh, that we have at the fund level, and we we, 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 we try to aggregate the different uh, indicators from the projects to be able to, to to learn about the portfolio and to be able to to analyze the portfolio. You you see that the qualitative uh, the quantitative info, information is not enough. You need to, to go into the details sometimes of, of, uh, of the projects and try to uh, get some um, qualitative information 
And I think that the, the for example, the portfolio monitoring mission would be would be a good way uh, to, to to collect those qualitative information. Uh, and it's essential for a complete understanding of, of, of what's going on at the ground level. So I see that um, this ends my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation about the, uh, the work of the Adaptation Fund and the, uh, the M&E focus uh, with respect to uh, climate change adaptation and these, and these projects. It's uh, really on project level uh, that we were talking about. Um, my name is Dennis Boers. I'm the, I'm the team leader of uh, the Sea Change Community of Practice, um, which is a community of practice that focuses on uh, uh, the monitoring and evaluation of climate change interventions. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the Adaptation Fund is working in, uh, in quite a number of countries, um, but most of them are not in Asia, yes. and, and I'm a member of an Asian community of practice, uh, which is in itself nice because there will be some cross-pollination uh, between the uh, focus countries of uh, the Adaptation Fund and the countries uh, in which I uh, see my members working. Um, and I want to take a slide that I have stolen from uh, Bruce Ramsload of Tango International uh, from a session yesterday. And that indicates immediately in one point and that's that the, the adaptation effort can really only be, be uh, measured when it's actually being challenged. And, and that leads to the first point of shocks and stresses, that you, you actually do need a shock or a stress. To, to be able to really say something about your, your adaptation. Um, and I put this slide up because the last three points here, three points here, you see absorptive capacity, adaptive capacity, and then you see transformative capacity. And I would say that only the first two are adaptation. And the third one, I would call resilience. And that we can have lengthy discussions about the defining of adaptation and resilience. Um, but the, the timelines of the, of the projects that we're talking about here is, is anywhere between three and five years. And I, I would definitely find that as, as, um, as adaptation, typical adaptation projects. They have resilience components for sure, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily call it transformative resilience. And we don't see a lot of programming in this world yet that really focuses on that type of resilience. It's something very new. It, it really needs a very long-term focus, a very long-term commitment, uh, and that is a commitment that, uh, that, that is hard to get yourself into, uh, especially because these are uh, very dynamic environments in which, you, in which you are doing your programming. And I, I made some notes about the outcomes of the, of the three programs, and I, I want to pick up a uh, report that we... I don't have any updates that we uh, recently did with the uh, UK Climate Impacts Program. Let's see if I can get this good screen. Well, it will work this way as well. Um, we did a report where we uh, looked at uh, 16 frameworks and tools that um, look at the monitoring and evaluation for climate change adaptation. And from this, I would like to uh, pick one, which is a little bit older, and that is on page 13. And this is a framework that comes from our friends from the UNDP. I'm taking this um, because they work on certain uh, thematic areas, and one of these areas is water. And what they say is that basically in each of these uh, thematic areas you need to have adaptation processes that, that uh, reach uh, a number of these, uh, you need to have interventions that reach a number of these processes. So you, have to, you need to have policy and planning, capacity building awareness, information management, investment decisions, 
and some practices, and in their case, that focuses on livelihoods and resource management, but I would call that the, the hard measures. Um, and when I look at Georgia, for example, the, one of the points was development policies, with, which links here to policy and planning. A second point was community level investments, which comes down to investment decision. A third point was uh, the development of institutional capacity, which comes down to policy planning and capacity building awareness. So uh, this is a bit of an older framework to, to get you in, a, in an adaptation process mindset. And I, I looked at these slides and I compared whether or not these uh, programs were fitting at least three out of the five processes. And the, the good thing was that I could say, yes, they, they do fit three out of the five processes, and in some cases even four or five, in this case four. And looking at the Honduras example, we had uh, institutional capacity as one point, then we had uh, awareness and ownership, which comes down to the capacity building and awareness element. Uh, we had the increase of adaptive capacity through national resource development, which comes down to hard measures and, and practices on livelihoods and resource management. Um, so also there you see three components being, uh, being covered. And the last one uh, was uh, Nicaragua. I don't know if I stick to the actual uh, flow of your presentation, but another one was Nicaragua, where they had uh, a reduced exposure as, as one point. And that was the only one that I had a little bit of a question about, because that outcome in itself would to me be an overarching outcome, the reduction of exposure, and not one of the, of the sub-elements in, in that whole picture. Uh, another one was livelihoods, and another one was policies and practices, which, which also nicely fits uh, this picture that we're seeing here. Um, so I was, I was pretty happy to, to compare these three um, projects and, and the points uh, put forward, and see that they fit these adaptation processes. Huh? Oh, they are you in the UNDP project. Oh, that's nice to, to hear that. I didn't even know that the adaptation firm and the UNDP were linked in that sense. So I'm, I'm happy that I chose this model because I, I wasn't aware of that link, to be honest. Um, and for the next point, towards the lessons, I would want to go to another page of the, of the M&E synthesis report that we developed, and that's page 28. And that focuses that there we find a framework that focuses more on the actual ME element. And that is the Adapt ME Toolkit of UKCIP. And I'll zoom that out a little bit. And what they do here is that they, that they look at a, at a number of domains uh, to take into account um, when you develop your ME plan, your ME design for adaptation. And I like this one of, of UKCIP because it, it just points you in directions on, okay, what do I need to think about? And I also took this one and, and, and looked at these programs. And one of the points in the top is, for example, purpose. Um, what, what is the purpose of the evaluation? What are we, do we want to learn? Is it for learning or is it for, for another um, element? Is it for just to report to donors? What, what is the purpose? Given that it's project level, I'm assuming that it's a mix of the two. It's both learning and accountability. Yeah. Um, the second point here is subject, going uh, clockwise. Um, what is really being evaluated here? What does it involve? Is it adaptive capacity? Or is it really adaptation actions? What is it in these, in these five um, domains that I just showed, for example, of UNDP? And we just saw that they fit three to four domains of those five. Uh, so the subject is pretty clear as well. After that, what's the logic and what are the assumptions behind it? We didn't really dive into that one uh, in the presentation. Um, but one of the questions I have uh, to you uh, to be answered um, after uh, my little talk is, did you take into account certain unexpected uh, consequences, both positive and negative? Because this morning in the presentation, we saw that there were positive unintended outcomes, but there can also be negative unintended outcomes. And it, it is good that these are taken into account already at the moment that you are making your theory of change and from that developing your logic framework. Uh, that can either be on the level of indicators or that can be on the level of assumptions that you make in your logic model. Um, another part, uh, challenges and limitations. Um, and that quite often comes down to, to, your, to the assumptions you make uh, when developing your, your m and &E design. Measuring progress. And that was one of the lessons. It's longer term, 
it needs continuous measurement. It's not a one-off, let's do it in month one, month three, month six, and, and see what we see. Uh, the point is that these processes are quite often non-linear. Uh, so if you do it in month six and month 12, you might get very positive results, but what has happened in between might have been some really negative elements that can have influences beyond the project that you don't see. So it's really key to, to look at continuous processes here. Um, another point is engaging and communicating. And I also had the feeling with the mixed method focus that you had that it was a combination of participatory work with uh, some more quantitative work, which was partly participatory and partly uh, external, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, so it's nice to see that mix in, in, these, uh, in these programs. Um, and yeah, the two questions are really about the unexpected, unintended impacts. And the second question I was having was, what about the measuring and operating over multiple levels? Because if I look at these processes that you're focusing on, policy planning was one, another one is more the hard measures, another one is capacity building. These take place possibly over different levels. There might be local government, subnational, national government. There might be village committees. Uh, there might be purely on household level. How do you link these levels? And, and that's that's a, an, an important last question that I'm having. That's great. Thank you. Um, so, Dada, do you want to just uh, take a crack at Dennis's uh, question, and then we'll open it up for questions? Try at least. Um, <laughs> On the issue of uh, unintended uh, effects and maladaptation, as we said, um, there are two aspects, um, and we we look at them before before a project is even approved for funding. It's 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 part of the review review process. So before the project is approved, and then during the monitor. Before the project is approved, you look at you, you look at the project document and, and based on the activities that are that are being um, you know, proposed, you look at the eventual uh, um, intended effects. And there is a specific section with instructions given to them when they prepare the proposals, mm -hmm. where they show not only the environmental. Um, economic and social benefits of that project, but also any uh, uh, risk of maladaptation. So they have to show both the benefits and the risk. And another level is at the level of the monitoring of risks mm -hmm. of the project, where you have the financial risks, you have the political risks, but also the environmental uh, risks. And there, when they uh, submit a proposal, they, they have to identify all those risks. And during the implementation of the project, they have to show uh, where, how they are mitigating those risks, if they have encountered any of those risks, how, uh, how they are planning to do it, and how they have done it. In the annual reports, they show it. And then yeah, at the, at the midterm and uh, final evaluation, those risks are going to be also analyzed more, more carefully. And what about the, 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 the levels, the, the second question? Yes, uh, okay. So about measuring and operating, um, I think that uh, you can take two, two levels different from these levels, the two levels of measuring those is um, at the project level first because on the ground when when you when you uh, draft your proposal based on the different stakeholders that you do, uh, that are going to participate in this in this um, in this project you develop your indicators and you know that these these indicators are going to be informed by if it's about um, capacity building at the institutional level you know that uh, to uh, inform on these indicators you will deal with the government and not with the communities when you have uh, indicators that are more uh, related to, to, to uh, uh, 
improvement of livelihoods of or uh, providing uh, information or awareness raising to the communities, you know, that you are going to deal with this community. So at, at the project level, to, to get those information, you know exactly where you're going to. And, and at the fund level, then based on the, the aggregation of the, 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 the indicators that, that, that we have, you can, you can say that, so, you know, these are for these stakeholders, these are for those stakeholders. That's not the way I, I, I see it. Um, okay, so I think we have time for maybe a couple of questions. If anyone has a question for Dada or Dennis. Uh, well, yeah. uh, Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> no, I, am, I am very interested in, in the question actually that Ben was brought up at the end about how do you link um, a lot of these processes that are going on at different scales. So, and uh, part of my research has been in uh, ecosystem governance. Um, and a lot of the literature that I've seen out there talks a lot about adaptive governance, that you have to have a very flexible approach, that um, where you're drawn from both perhaps informal rules and processes at the local level, um, and you have these multiple scales in a very complex system, right? Um, and it's, it seems to me quite difficult for a project, perhaps at the very on outset, you know, the proposal level, to be able to develop it, to know what all the indicators should be, until you actually start getting on the ground and you connecting, perhaps, with different, you know, various actors at the various levels, to so kind of start seeing what is going to develop, and then. And so I'm wondering, you know, is there any flexibility yeah. uh, in that institution plan for projects to, be, to operate? So, I mean, it's maybe a little bit more of a develop, developmental evaluation kind of way of operating that you're dealing with quite complex systems. Yeah, that's a great question, and Dada, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I have one specific example. Um, last year, we went to visit one of, one of our projects, the one in Senegal. Almost closing, and uh, um, that was the first project that was uh, approved by the fund. So at that time, they had put together, you know, indicators. We were not there yet in terms of uh, the the result framework of the adaptation plan and all of the other um, uh, tools that that we have now. So. At that time, they, they had their framework and uh, they got approved and they started implementation. And it was about you know building some some sea walls in some areas where there were uh, coastal erosion. Um, the implementing entity um, was uh, dealing with some executive partners, and uh, they focused on. Um, advancing in, in their activities. When we went to visit, we had a set of specific questions based on the, the new framework that we have, based on um, the different levels that we wanted to, 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 to look at. We wanted to look at the communities, at the local government, at the central government, what was going on in the country in terms of um, coastal, um, 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 coastal management, policies, etc. One of the outcomes, uh, one of the um, uh, expected out, outputs of the project was that um, a low on coastal management would be, would be uh, uh, voted by the parliament and it didn't happen. And we, so we were asking a set of questions related to, 
to sustainability related to replicability that at the time of implementation and the way they were focused on um, uh, dealing with their activities and finishing their activities, they were not at the same level at the, than, than us. So the fact that we went there asking those questions, uh, that made them think about uh, some aspects that were not uh, really uh, in their mind at that time. So I think it, it helps and, and um, to, to have maybe some, some uh, external look at the way you dealing with the system. It's, it's best to have it before the project is approved, of course. It's best to have a, 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 a clear framework where you say, okay, these are the different levels I'm going to deal with, these are, uh, how, this is how I look at this project, and these are my plans for scaling up, these are the plans for sustainability, but in the real world, sometimes it's very difficult. So it's, uh, it's good to, 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 to think about this, as you say, but it's, it's more difficult to, to, to do it from the beginning. But if I go to implementation, and they do a lot of their on-the-ground stakeholder consultations during that, you know, between when they get the funding and when they first have their first stakeholder meeting. Um, so we allow for that. And the, the key is that they have to report back to us and that the, the overall goal of the project doesn't change and the outcomes shouldn't change. I mean, maybe what you're measuring changes, but they can't change completely what, what the outcomes they're trying to achieve. But the idea of our results system is that there should be adaptive management. We try not to micromanage exactly what their, the indicators are at the project level. What we try to do is an, in Dada's slides, he was trying to show where they where they would align with our, our framework, that for those, for that one or two indicators where, that they're tracking, for those two, that they try and, and, and track that indicator according to our methodology. Um, but other than that one or two, the rest is very much context-based um, within the project. And we just, we really need the, that baseline after the first year. And once they establish that, then we track based on that. Um, so just to, from a process perspective. Um, I think you had one question, okay, and then sorry. I think we're, we've run out of time. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, look, um, thanks for mentioning the comparative frameworks, because, it, I mean, there is quite a, an overlap, and there should be, actually, because uh, no matter how you develop a framework, it has those fairly common elements. The question really, then, is, uh, what results are you expecting from those particular aspects of the intervention? And, and uh, you know, if you if you participated in a, another discussion with USA, you see it's, it's quite ambitious. In other words, you start with the results, you know, at the high level, and then you work down, 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 all, all the intermediate results, which are going to lead to that goal, which goes a little bit beyond the frameworks of well, you must have a bit of this and that, and choose what you'd like. It, it, it's, it's, it really gets very integrated into the whole structure of a project. Mm -hmm. That's one point. The second thing, you know, this is an interesting innovation in a way because you're working with, uh, let's say, pretty, uh, what in some ways would be seen as monitoring data, but from aggregating that, the word was used, uh, then you want to be able to see a complete picture over time. Um, and that's something which, you know, most people are a little bit uh, con uh, concerned about uh, doing, but, but it would be very interesting to see because it's sort of some ways you could do more metadata analysis of this because at least you've been governing the components, you know, what the samples are and, 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 and so forth. And, 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 you know, it would be a very interesting result to be able to appraise. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's not uh, as black as white as the first comment you made that you look at, uh, okay, we want reduced exposure, that's our, that's our big thing, or we want increased resilience. Uh, uh, yes, that's what you want. But you're not going to say, okay, we have, we have one million, and we have ten people, and this will be the activities because of this and this and this. I think it's, a, it's a more and more these days to talk about twin track, track uh, um, processes. I think it's, it's both. You, you look at, okay, what do people actually need 
I hope you, you look at that in, in, in the location. And how does that link to what we as a big donor, as a funder, hope for in, in, in the bigger picture? Uh, so I, I, I don't agree that you, that you develop it from, from, okay, this is the big thing we want to do in 43 countries and, and we're going to attach activities and then outputs and outcomes. I think it's more that you're going to look at what, what is really the need in, in this location and what kind of outcome do we hope for? And then you go up towards that, that bigger uh, open organizational overarching goal. I hope for. Yeah. Um, great. So thank you all for coming. I think we've uh, the session has uh, ended time-wise. Um, and um, keep, keep following us. Our, our process is still evolving, and we are very open to any feedback on our systems. So thank you very much.